the, the true world. A lot of guys, because they work in TV, would go commercial, get good fares in the United back then, and be able to spend the night and still put all the money in your pocket, kind of break the week up. Or what some of us often did was to charter a private plane so we could go to the back the same night. <laughs> and so we went to Miami that night, and I remember it was a private plane with, with Bob Roop, Dick Burdick, and myself, with some beer and a small plane that only seated four people with a pilot, like you had to be overweight. And I remember as we were about to leave Miami, the buddy Colt had had his plane and some of the guys were with him so they could get back to Miami that night. And I remember looking out the window and they kind of taxied slowly by us. And I remember seeing Bobby Shane's face in the window and he made eye contact with me and I remember him waving his hand at me. And they took off a couple of minutes ahead of us. And as we were flying, as often happens, a squall came through and just the rain, horrific rain for that, for that small storm as it moves through. So we're, you know, Murdoch had some beer, we're sitting there just enjoying the time. We had a great house in Miami and we're gonna get home that night. And, you know, we're, because it's a small plane and we had hired a pilot, so we're here and they have the radio transmissions. And I remember the tower saying to our pilot, we have uh, 456 BC, which I believe was Buddy Cole's plane, on final, but we never got confirmation you know, of, the, of the landing. So when you guys land, just confirm 456 BC and, and radio that to us too. Which I never thought of another thing. A minute or two goes by, the, the tower comes on, we get 456 BC, we have a report that they're down in the bay of the transfer. You, you could have heard a pin drop in that plane. And your mind starts going crazy about what you're going to face. And I remember with, with the pilots, King and Rain, he's getting the coordinates coming in. We had started on a, 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 a small private airport inland from Tampa. The weather that came in closed, that airport closed Tampa International. And the only way you could land was Peter O'Knight on that little peninsula was still open. And that's where uh, the gold was going to land. And we're dead silent when that thing came through to get 456 BC reported down in the bay. And we came through and our pilots listened intensely to the instructions and you couldn't see the ground. All of a sudden we broke through the clouds and it was as clear as if we were sitting in this room right here. And the cloud cover was like about, seemed like what, where the, the ceiling was. Like a cold thing of clouds and just as clear to the runway. So we land, and I guess some people were listening to the police radios that the wrestlers supposedly had a plane crash. So people, fans jumped in their cars and someone came over and were already there. We landed, they thought maybe there'd been a crash at the airport. And so when we got out, we didn't have our cars. They were inland at that small airport. So some fans said, well, we'll give you a ride to your cars. And as we went around the peninsula, which you had to drive from the tip to get back to the mainland, we could see flashing red lights. And we stopped and Dick Murdoch and I got out and the bay was to our left and the water was choppy and it was like a drizzling rain and it was pitch dark and there was two houses. And as we went to walk between the houses, Buddy Gold was laying on the lawn. And as we looked down, this one ankle was grotesquely not at an angle that the ankle, that the ankle should have been. We knew he was hurt. And, and, the, and the paramedics had got there right about a minute or two before us. And because of Buddy Colt's size, they couldn't figure out a way to get him onto the gurney to get him into an ambulance. So Dick Murdoch and I got down and hitched our arms underneath his, his uh, trunk of his body and locked hands and we physically lifted Buddy Colt off the ground far enough that they could slide a, 
a thing between them to get him out. And there was a helicopter searching with a searchlight looking for the wreckage, which they couldn't find the, the drizzling rain. And finally, there was what had happened was uh, Gary Hart had already gone to the hospital, and the tide was down. When the, when the plane went down, they were all thrown, and Gary Hart bobbed up, up in the water looking around. He and Buddy Colt, as injured as Buddy was, made their way, and, and Gary helped Buddy get up the, the storm ladder with the tide out to where he could get up on the grass in the back of the house that actually belonged to a doctor who didn't speak any English. And so Buddy crawled between, and Gary Hart had went up banged on the, the back patio window and you think if you were a doctor and you didn't speak English and somebody was banging on your back window at the dead of night nothing behind it but the bay a lot of people would have come with a gun and maybe not asked any questions and this doctor opened it here was Gary Hart because he had a wound on his head covered with blood and he called for help and he had already gone to the hospital, and we got there and helped Buddy Cole out. Bobby Shane was uh, still on down at the There was nothing more that we could do, and I was going back to Houston the next day. I was just moving into the territory, and I remember going to the, uh, the sport joint for TV, and a couple of the paramedics, a couple of the emergency rescue people came in, and they had found uh, Bobby Shane. They found the wreckage of the plane, one engine was here, one engine was there. The canopy part was all gone. The engine looked like the very Hulk had gone in there and taken all the instruments, wires and everything, and just yanked them out. And I said, there was Bobby Shane still strapped in his seat. And the guy said, I know you're gonna hear stories about him, you know, just in a panic, trying to pull that seatbelt loose so he could get out and then he drowned. And he said, I've made enough rescues in situations like that that I can tell you, in all honesty, because he was a friend of yours, that when we saw him, his arms were floating up in the air. And from doing that kind of rescues before, we knew that he was knocked out on impact and never suffered and, and drowned. And he said, we took and cut the seatbelt that had been by the belt and just floated him out. And so it was a sad day to have lost Bobby Shane, but it also was peace to his family to know that if he, if he was gone, that he, that he suffered. He didn't suffer. He was not unconscious. And, uh, so that's, uh, I've relived that moment God knows how many times. And um, I see Buddy Cole, it's all today, and it's the kind of thing that, because I, I would, you hear stories about somebody that survived something and then questions about why am I alive and somebody like Bobby Shane didn't make it. So it's not something that we talk about. You remember that night when Murdoch and I picked Jeff up now? We, that we don't even have that conversation. I don't know if he thinks about it. I think about it, but I never, never want to say something. But Bobby Shane was going to come in, and we were all excited he was coming in to be the booker. And I was his tag team partner the night before and after the match in Miami. He died in that crash. And Harley Race came in and, and took over with no notice and accepted responsibilities. I stayed there, and that was the era where you knew Roger Kirby very well. Roger and I teamed up and became part of the tag title. So it was a, a wonderful year in one respect, and also a sad year as to how we got in that position, how hard it was looking, and how we sat there on the shape.